when we do something that's very valuable to someone else, they feel unconsciously bound to reciprocate. In this form, it's to work with you rather than any other architect. Business of Architecture, episode 248. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and I am your host as we go on this journey to discover the tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and hyper-profitable architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Have you ever been frustrated by the feast or famine cycle of not enough work or too much work? It seems to happen a lot in the industry. What if there was a way that you could control the number of meetings that you had with qualified people who are predisposed to working with you, just like turning on and off the the tap to a faucet? Tom Poland is the creator of Leadsology, the science of being in demand, and he's developed a process that does exactly this. And on this episode today, we're going to talk about that. And I, I really dive deep into this with Tom. I asked him some difficult questions, and I want to know your feedback on how you enjoyed this episode. Uh, Tom really knows what he's talking about, and I think you will get a lot of value out of listening very carefully to what Tom is teaching in, in this episode. You'll also discover the four R's of an effective client conversation, the hurdles that you need to help a potential client overcome before they'll move ahead, and four attributes your potential clients must have before you ever speak with them. Tom Poland, welcome to the business of architecture. Thanks, Enoch. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. So, Tom... So we're going to be talking a bit about lead generation. So you're a man after my own heart. I mean, I love the concept of generating leads and finding leads for businesses. In the architecture industry, it's not something that we typically talk about with those Mm. words. We typically don't talk about generating leads for an architecture firm. So just to start us off, how do you define generating leads? What does that mean? That's that's one of the, the best questions I've ever heard in an interview because most people don't even ask that um, because they don't know probably as much about marketing as you do. Because people talk about prospects and clients, but in between that, there's a lead. And people's definition of leads varies, but my definition is this. A lead is someone who has booked a time to talk with you and they know what your fee range is already. And they know pretty much the type of work you do and what you produce and how you work with clients. And they also know, well, they also feel that you are one of their very best choices, if not their only choice. And that's what I call a lead. They, they have proactively booked a time. So the lead is inbound. That's what, what we do is it's all inbound lead. There's no cold calling. There's no going to business networking meetings. There's no sending out 10,000 direct mail letters and hoping and praying someone. They're all inbound. So that's my definition of a lead. They those three characteristics. Well, four, if you, if you count the fact that they have proactively reached out and found find a time to talk with you about becoming a client, that's the first characteristic. Second one, they know your fee range. They know how you work with their clients and the sort of product you produce, and they regard you, if not as one of their very best options, possibly even their only option. That's a lead. Okay, so you gave me three ki- criteria there, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Tom, and I'd like to unpack those with you. The first one was inbound. I'll just re- repeat them to make sure I understand them, and then we can dive into each one. First one was inbound. Okay. Second one was understanding uh, general fee range, so they know what they can expect to, to pay when they work with you. And the third one, remind me. Well, the third the third one was that they have they know the sort of work you produce. So if it's an eco-residential property, they know about that, or if it's a commercial high-rise, they know about that. Uh, and and the fourth one is they regard you as, if not one of their very best choices, then quite possibly their only real choice. Based upon <laughs> this definition of a lead, right? I'm going to guess there's some background that needs to happen before the person ever reaches out to you. So walk me through. Let's start with right. incoming. Define that for me, Tom. Income. Okay. So someone finds. So so what we do is we set up a link, which is an online link, and. You know, uh, it could be book a time with Enoch.com. But, it, but I would recommend that an architect find, gets a link 
you know, book a chat with us or whatever it happens to be. But but it's a unique link. And people find that link. And because of the experience they've had before they find that link, they click on it. And they book a time to talk with you. And as, as we've discussed, they, they know a lot about you, including fee range and how you work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens before that? And the reason we use the link, by the way, is pretty simple. It's, it's got to be a unique link because it's no good just using, say, Calendly or Time Trade or something like that because you might, you might change the platforms one day. So it's got, and if you do your marketing right, you're going to have a lot of these spread around your digital community, whatever community area you serve. And you don't want that link to be broken one day if you simply decide you don't like Calendly, you want to upgrade somewhere else. So it's a unique link. Um, it's very easy to remember. I have, for example, book a chat with tom.com. That's pretty easy to remember. There's no leadsology.com forward slash book hyphen go to, you know, it's just easy to remember. So get that, first of all. Then what we need to ask, I guess, is, well, how do they find the link or where do they find the link? And what experience have they had prior to finding that link that would motivate them to want to reach out and think, well, you know, Tom, Enoch, John, Sue, whoever is probably my best choice to help me with this architectural project. And this is the great chasm. This is the great canyon or dividing line between architects who thrive and architects who survive. And that chasm is what happens before people, in this case, find the link. It's the experience. And I say to people to illustrate this, it's, it's, You've got to realize that when you're selling architectural services, it's far more like you're proposing marriage than it is selling a car. And we'll, we'll get it, I'm happy to get into the weeds on this, but you could imagine if I had a, let's say I had a car sales yard and suddenly I was a car salesperson and, and I had this brand new car and it was exactly the model you wanted and it was half the price of any other deal in the country and it came with a 10 year factory back warranty. Brand new, never been driven. So you cannot lose, right? And you come out of the car yard and you look at the car and you think, holy cow, I can't believe that's half the price. That's incredible. And I come out glad handing, slap back, slapping your back and saying, how are you? I'd love to sell your car today. And I'm rubbing my hands with glee. And you're thinking, Ick, I don't like this guy. Question, do you still buy the car? The answer is almost universally, hell yes. <laughs> it's what I want. It's half the price. It's got a factory back warranty. You don't have to like me. You don't have to click with me. You, it's a commodity transaction. You know what you want. You buy it. That is not the case when someone is looking at architectural services. They're going to have to work with you as an architect over a protracted period of time. They're going to want to know beforehand. Uh, they're going to have a. You, you need to establish a relationship with you beforehand at least at least four levels. One is they've got to be able to uh, click with you, rapport. I can work with this person. So they've got to have an experience which will validate that. They need to have an experience also where they respect you and your professional integrity and your ability to deliver on the promise, deliver what they want. Um, the third level, which is really getting to deep levels of influence now, is ideally they've had an experience where they really feel you can relate to their dreams and their hopes and their desires and their problems and the challenges in respect to their architectural project. And the fourth level, which virtually no one gets to, is reciprocity. It's a very powerful psychological force that when we do something that's very valuable to someone else, they feel unconsciously bound to reciprocate. In this form, it's to work with you rather than any other architect. I notice you have some alliteration going on there. <laughs> that's how I remember things. <laughs> exactly right. Re re Rapport, respect, relatability, and reciprocity. Yep, that's great. So we have the four R's. So that is what goes into the experience. What can you tell us about creating that experience, about creating that rapport, creating that respect, mm. the relatability, and the reciprocity? Mm. So when we, if we, if we I'll create a little metaphor so I can explain how to create the experience and, and what form it should take. If you can imagine a 100-meter track, and at the end of the 100 meter track is a pot of gold over the finish line, if you like. And standing at the start line is your prospect. This is the person who's considering an architectural project. And the pot of gold represents your value proposition. It's, it's what you're saying we can do for clients, right? Maybe they've visited your website or maybe they've had a chat with you. And metaphorically speaking, you've put the pot of gold there at the finish line. 
But you notice they're still standing at the start line. You're thinking, why aren't they moving towards the pot of gold? It's a freaking pot of gold. In other words, I'm really good at what I do, and I've got all these this list of happy clients, and I know I can deliver on what they want. And I thought I've articulated that, but they're not crossing the start line. And the question, of course, is why aren't they? And the answer is that we might see the pot of gold and, and the 100-meter track and the prospect, but what the prospect sees is hurdles between them and the pot of gold. And the number one hurdle is risk. Is this thing going to work out? Am I going to burn money? Am I going to get frustrated? Am I going to get tired? Because maybe I did an architectural project, uh, architectural project 10, 20 years ago, and it just, geez, it was a pain in the butt, you know? And we just, uh, and it dragged on. And, and so that's the risk. And that's, if it's not going on consciously, which it probably is, it's at the very least going on unconsciously. Anytime they've made a major investment in the past and they've had some issue with it, that will bring up that hurdle of risk. So that hurdle needs to be taken away. Uh, and I'll get to do that how, how in a moment, but still metaphorically speaking, another hurdle is price. Can they afford you? You really don't want to be talking to people who have no chance on earth of affording your services. Otherwise, you're meeting with people and it's like I call it milking mice. You know, it's you just can't get much milk out of a mouse. And it, it's frustrating for you and it's painful for the mouse. Everyone walks away disappointed. So you, you want to filter those people out because, or at least direct them to someone else that might be able to help them, but you don't really want to be meeting with them. Um, so we've got risk, we've got price, and we've got features. So how do you work with clients? They, they want to know how it all works. That's Once someone sees the pot of gold and you remove the first two hurdles, the first question you'll hear from them is, so how does it work? How, how do you work with clients? And they, they want a lot of assurances in that area. So once you've we can now look at this 100-meter track and we, we can see what the prospect sees. We can see the hurdles. And, and very often, if I'm sharing this with an audience, I'll say, do you, would you now agree? And I have a visual on the screen with this person with 100-meter. Would you now agree this is what the prospect really sees? And everybody goes, yep, that's what the prospect sees. And then I change the slide trick question because there are three exits down the track, three other alternatives to get to different pots of gold. It's called direct competitors, other architects, indirect competitors, maybe drafts people or my cousin Sally has done, you know, almost graduated from drafting school or whatever and is do it yourself. Really bad idea, but some people do. <laughs> so we've got to make those exits disappear and we've got to remove the hurdles. So to do that, and we do all of this before we propose marriage, so to speak. So that means that we need time with people. We need to give people who are considering this very serious investment, which is normally for most people a significant amount of money, we need to give them time with us and our brand so we can remove the hurdles and seal off the exits. So none of these things happen when you go to a networking meeting and you find a prospect. It doesn't happen at a dinner conversation, sharing a glass of red wine. It happens when you get them to go through a series, for example, let's just do some for instances, and this may or may not apply depending on the market people are serving, whether it's a commercial market, an industrial market, or a domestic market, or a not-for-profit market, or an environmental market, It'll depend on what sort of assets we set up. But um, people read my book, and that gives me the time with that person to take them through what I call a persuasion sequence, whereby the hurdles disappear and the exits disappear, and they start moving towards the pot of gold. A webinar can work very well, um, but what works even better for architects are what I call boardroom briefings. And a boardroom briefing is scalable because there's a group of six prospective clients, prospects at this stage, not leads, uh, on a call, it's webcams on, and you walk them through a set sequence, 10 steps through a presentation, which make the hurdles disappear and, and the exits disappear. And uh, things like, and you could imagine, most people have been to a webinar, so if you imagine just six people in the web, webinar, webcams are on, so it's no one's clearing emails, which you do. I know what you do in a webinar. I know what you do in my webinar. You clear emails while I'm talking. So no one's doing that. No one's checking the Facebook because it's webcams on. It's incredibly exclusive. And it's ideal for high fee paying, prospective high fee paying clients. Very interactive and it's still scalable for the architect. So um, that's an example. And that gives us an hour with a prospect. And we walk them through these 10 steps, which builds the, the rapport, the respect, the relatability and reciprocity. We start with something, for example, why listen to me? Because it's a question that we should address at the beginning of, of a book, of a video series, of a meeting. We should not do that at the end because <laughs> we want to open people's minds, go, hey, you know, you're not knows what he's talking about. So, so why listen to me? And then what's the problem? What's the problem or the opportunity? 
the problem we're here to solve or the opportunity we're here to meet. And if you have this problem or opportunity, what are the symptoms? What are you feeling? What are you experiencing? And then we go on to another step. What have you probably tried in the past? Or what have other people tried? And why would that be a mistake? And why should you avoid that? So we go through a series of 10 steps, which and that gives us the opportunity to allow the client, so I should give the opportunity to the client, the prospective client, to allow them to uh, satisfy themselves that if the architect is not one of the very best choices, they are the only choice. Thanks, Tom. So you've described for me so far what sounds, what I would say is sort of like a filter a mechanism where you can get people together, you can take them through those four R's, as you said. I'd like to backtrack a stack and say, you know, in terms of if going back to this concept of lead generation for architects, it's very unlike a lot of the other fields out there. You know, mm. architecture, the way, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a very high dollar, high value service. It's very relationship based. So let's talk about strategies that you've seen working or you believe would work for my audience here. Uh, so we can make this conversation really valuable for them. Okay. So that is, there's a couple of questions inherent in that one, I think. And the first question is, what's, what's the right way to give the prospects the experience, right? Is it, is it a webinar? Is it a boardroom briefing? Is it a quiz? And, and is that a part of what you're asking? Let's, let's go before that. So I, let's just say that the boardroom briefing is going to be the way. That's a, a strategy that I think would apply mm. pretty much across the mm. board. Now, we have two segments in the architecture industry that we can sort of separate our listeners out in, Tom. It's going to be firms who do business to business, and it's going to be firms that do business to consumer. So right. B2C would be people who are working with homeowners, looking for renovations, new home builds. They're working directly with homeowners, basically. Business to business is going to be everything else. It's going to be mom and pop shops all the way up to universities and hospitals that need architectural services. Right. So um, it's going to vary between each of those two markets because the B2B market thinks and operates differently. They do things differently, particularly if you're looking at uh, very senior execs. For example, you know, the, one of my clients had an inquiry the other day from the vice president of Coca-Cola. So that's a very busy individual. Um, still inbound, still booked to time, and, and all the same principles apply. So th I think there's three, three levels to answer this question. The first level at a strategic level is, is how are you different? What are you going to present that's completely different to what any of your direct or indirect competitors offer? And that means you come up with proprietary something. And, and behind me, you can see Leadsology registered trademark. So that's proprietary. Lots of people in the world can help you with marketing. There's only one guy in the world that can help you with leadsology. So the moment you come up with a proprietary name for what you do and how you do it, and you register that, uh, suddenly you're the only person who's got that thing. And, and I think that's there's a lot more to the strategy than that. There's, there's the marketing message uh, so that that's going to get cut through and get the attention of the right people. Uh, as I mentioned, there's the proprietary registration of a unique name or term. There's other stuff as well. So let, let me just put that out there. That first of all, that's one of the foundation things that has to happen. So right from the get-go, people look at your brand and they go, oh, that's different. Now, they might, they might like it. If they like it, they probably love it. And if they don't like it, they probably hate it. So it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a divider. The next, next level to answer that question is that the asset has to be relevant to the audience. You know, I've got uh, Monty, the marketing wonder dog here is my border collie friend. And out the back in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the garden, we've got his dinner bowl, and we also have four beehives. Now, I can get the best bunch of flowers in the world and put it in Monty's dinner bowl, and he's going to look at me like I've gone slightly nuts, you know, look up at me with his, his eyes and go, you crazy, I'm not going to eat that. But if I put them in front of the beehive, they're all over it. So the asset has to match the audience, and you will have different assets to the high-end corporate client, the prospects, I should say, than you will to the domestic ones. So let's, we talked about webinars before and how webinars are a terrific, a terrific list builder and a terrific lead generator and can be also for, for architects in the domestic market, but they don't work for high-end corporate execs who get 100 emails every hour, who have eight meetings in a day that pro probably should only have six. They're amongst the most time poor and stressed people on, on earth. Um, so webinars don't work for them, but what do work, does work for them uh, are diagnostic tools, are surveys, uh, I mentioned boardroom briefings before, which is kind of like a small uh, small webinar, but webcams on, they all work. So we've got to match the asset to the audience. Third answer to the question, and happy to get more into the weeds on this, but just big picture. So the first one is it's got to be differentiated. 
registering a proprietary term or name for the service can help with that, marketing message, et cetera. Uh, secondly, we've got to match the asset to the audience to make sure it's you're delivering the experience to the prospect in a format which is which suits their personality and their needs. The third one is how do we know they're even interested in coming to a boardroom briefing or to a webinar or whatever it might happen to be? And this is this is where I want to use another analogy it just for a moment. It only takes a minute, so let's do this. So there's a forest full of bears, and and the forest is a metaphor for your marketplace, be that commercial or residential. The bears are all asleep, and some of them are hungry and some of them aren't. We don't know which ones are hungry and which ones aren't. So the bears represent prospective clients, and the hungry ones represent people that are actually ready to buy, and the others represent people who have no interest at all in your honey. You've got a couple of options here. So what the sales trainers will teach you is something the equivalent of getting a very long, sharp stick and going running through the forest, finding a bear, jagging, jabbing it in the bum with a pointy stick and waking it up and then waving the honeypot in front of its nose. That's cold calling, right? You know, it's sending out direct mails to people. We don't have no idea if they have an interest whatsoever. So you wave the honeypot in front of the bear's nose and if the bear's hunger exceeds its anger, it eats the honey and not you. That's one way of doing lead gen, uh, but it's not inbound, it's outbound. The other way is you get the honey pot and you put it outside the forest and the hungry ones start dreaming they're swimming in honey, then they wake up, realize they're not, but they still smell the honey and they come out of the forest and say, yeah, I'm kind of interested in that. So we've talked about creating this experience, either a book or a webinar or a boardroom briefing, but some, some experience whereby a prospect can immerse themselves so that we can establish rapport, respect, relatability, and reciprocity. How do we know they're interested in coming to that one-hour meeting? And that's where the honeypot comes in. And the honeypot is um, could be a short guide, like this one I've created that says how to stop relying on random acts of marketing and instead use my Leadsology model to systemize the flow of leads. And it's a downloadable PDF. We can ship it out to people as well. That's a honeypot. If someone is interested in that, then it's very likely they're going to be interested in a more immersive experience. So now you can see why I say this is more like proposing marriage than it is selling a car. Because when I met my now first wife, I literally saw her across the other side of a crowded room and I fell in love at first sight. And, and it was like a spiritual experience. The whole of the rest of the room literally went out of focus. All, all, literally all I was in focus was the head and shoulders. I could have gone up to her and I'd heard about love at first sight, but I'd never experienced it. I could have gone up to her and said, hi, my name is Tom, will you marry me? And I'm pretty sure I know what the answer would have been. <laughs> So we had some dates first. And so inbound lead gen for high ticket items such as architecture, we've got to let people have some dates with us. And we, we, we've got to allow them to experience our brand and grow to trust us before we propose. And the proposal essentially in architectural language is let's sit down and talk about what you're wanting to do and see if we can help. Um, Tom, have you ever worked with any architecture firms help them generate leads? Yes. And what have been the lead generation strategies that you've seen working for those firms? Way back, way back when, when I started doing this in 1995, we used physical boardroom briefings. So we would uh, create the presentation, as I've mentioned earlier. So we'd walk people through the 10 steps of a persuasion sequence. But they would be in a boardroom, literally in a boardroom. So we'd get people into the architect's boardroom or into their office and walk them through that sequence. Um, these days, we, we tend to do that online unless it's geographically very convenient and the architect has a nice boardroom, then we can certainly get people in there. Um, but other than that, we're doing them online. So how does, in your experience, how do the bears, how do the bears wise up that there's a pot of honey outside of the forest? So where, yeah, so where do we find the bears? Yep. Right. Um, and that's where we, we use contractors because... Um, and I'm not wishing to offend anyone here, but again, if we could dive into the realm of arch uh, metaphors, I would say architects are dogs and I'm a dog and metaphorically speaking, well, not metaphorically, you know, dogs like to bark, they're no good at meowing. Metaphorically speaking, what I'm saying is that um, architects like to meet with clients and they like to do architectural work. They don't want to do lead gen. They don't want to do prospecting. They don't want to have to go on LinkedIn and stalk people and copy and paste a thousand messages every week. And even if they thought that would deliver new clients, they wouldn't persist with it because it's so far outside of their personality type that they're just not going to do it. 
But cats like meowing and cats like, you know, metaphorically speaking, in our world, we have contractors, metaphorically speaking, these are the cats, and they like routine and they like detail and they like plotting persistence. And so what we do with leadsology is we hire contracts to find people, to data mine, to offer them the honeypots. When people pick up a honeypot, we know they're probably going to be interested in the next step, which is this more immersive experience. So what the architect does is the architect does two things. They show up to meetings to present. So they have to be able to, you know, put together an hour-long presentation, but we help them with that. But they have to be they have to be the sort of people that are okay talking to a small group of people. Um, it doesn't have to be a small group of people, it has to be one person at least. <laughs> Otherwise, so much of an audience. Um, and they have to be willing to turn up to consults. My experience was this, and and the professionals, I only work with professionals, so uh, that's so I don't work with people who are, are well, let me put this another way. I work with professionals who are marketing the invisible. That means architects, say financial planners, uh, perhaps uh, executive coaches, corporate trainers, um, strategic consultants, and so on. So so they all have one thing in common, is they, have, they don't have a physical thing they're marketing. They have this intangible thing they're marketing. And what I've discovered with this type of person is that if they have a meeting to show up for, they're very good at showing up for that meeting. And so if they open their calendar on a Monday morning and they see there's three meetings that have been booked by a prospective client to talk with them about becoming a client, then the architect will show up that meeting. If the architect sees that every Thursday morning at nine o'clock, they have a small presentation to do online or in the boardroom to a small group of people, they will show up to the meeting and they will probably run that meeting with aplomb, with finesse. But they don't want to have to get the people to the meeting. So what Leadsology does is, is part nine of the Leadsology model talks about the person's style, my client's style, their personality, their vision, their values. So whatever marketing my clients engage in, it has to feel like it's fitting like a glove on a hand. Otherwise, they don't persist with it. It's like, otherwise, it's like teaching a dog how to meow. You know, you, you can send a dog to meow school, but six weeks later, they'll be back barking. We all revert to type. So we've got to get the lead generation system aligned with the personality type, in this case of the architect, who are really happy to talk with people and they're really happy to work on value delivery, client work, but they don't want to spend eight hours a day doing marketing lead gen. So it's what I call just show up marketing. Just show up to the meetings, do your thing, do what you're born to do, and we get some contractors to do the rest for you. And what exactly are the contractors doing to fill up those meetings? Um, so the contractors, so what we do is for each client, we create a checklist of what we would call suspects. This is what a suspect looked like. Uh, so, for example, there might be certain demographics which an architect is, is targeting. Um, if it's an environmentally aware person, they'll be in certain groups, perhaps on LinkedIn or Facebook. They'll be in other people's networks, which is a really big one for us. Uh, for example, you have my clients in your network. Some of them don't realize they're going to be my clients yet, but they're there. So um, we've had, we have systems in place so that the contractors, and, and the key to this whole system is pre-selection, pre-selection of the right contractors. Our contractors are typically in the Philippines. They get paid a living wage, which is pretty inexpensive for us, but good for them, with a monthly bonus for the number of qualified people that I have registered and turning up to the meetings, boardroom briefings, webinars, whatever it happens to be. So essentially what we're doing is we're finding other people's networks. So people think leadsology is about finding, finding you know, the right clients. It's not. It's about finding the people who have the right clients. So we're always looking for groups, and that's what the contractors are changed, tra trained in, is they're trained to identify the people who have the architect's potential clients in their group. And in a, in a big city, there's hundreds of these groups. In a small town, there might be five or six. But normally, the size of the architectural firm is proportionate to size of the catchment area. So therefore, the groups of potential clients are similarly proportionate. In other words, there's enough to go around. So if you, if you want to look at it, I call it the layer cake. At the bottom of layer, layer four, people are finding a time to talk with the accountant. At layer three, that person has had an experience, an immersive experience with the client's brand, so they've, they've built respect, sorry, rapport, respect, relatability, and reciprocity. 
Um, at level three, going up one more level, where do the audiences come from? They come from other people's networks. And level four, who's identifying and laying out the honeypots? The contractors. So all the architect does is show up. They show up, uh, conduct a presentation, and then conduct the potential new client consults. And what are the strategies that the contractors are using to actually invite people to those meetings? Right. Again, it's going to de depend on the asset. We don't, oh, sorry, on the audience. We don't want to put, uh, you know, flowers in, in Monty's dinner bowl. Um, so typically, there's going to be a, a PDF, a downloadable PDF of some description. And the title of that is, is not something like why you should buy architectural services. <laughs> it's, it's very specific and it's very customized from one market to the other. So, um, I, I think I started to say before the contractor, has a checklist. It has the profile of the ideal client and where they're likely going to be hanging out. So the, the recruitment and the training of the contractor is actually a very, um, it's a very short, it's a very short duration because they have a very clear profile of who they need to be looking for. There is a bit in here, and I'm really happy, as I said, to get into the weeds. But there's a bit in here as to how does the architect establish such a high level of rapport with someone else who has their potential clients in the network? Uh, and and that's, that's a really good question. And uh, there's multiple ways of doing that. But one of them, case in point, is, is you interview them. So there's three things the architect mm, should be doing. Sounds familiar. Yeah, it's exactly, yeah. There's three things the architect should be doing every single week to create the growth in their practice, which is indestructible. And I call this titanium triangle. Titanium because it's indestructible, it's more valuable than gold, and triangle because there's three times, three sides. Every single week, they need to do something that grows their list of potential prospects. And when I say list, I mean subscribers, email subscribers. Every single week, they should be doing something that nurtures that architectural brand in the brain until people are ready to buy. And every single week, there should be some form of event happening where there's a call to action, where people are asked, if they're satisfied that um, all the boxes have been ticked, that they book a time to speak with the architect about becoming a client. So I know our system sounds a little complicated, but if we just want to look at a big picture, uh, it's incredibly low cost. There's no advertising costs. There's no affiliate costs. Um, it's relatively simple once it's set up because someone else is effectively doing all the marketing for the architect. And all the architect is doing show, is to show up to meetings, as many meetings as they deem they want to have. And all the way through this process, there is no pitching, there's no selling, there's no scarcity, there's no free Gingsu steak knives. It's just honest, authentic giving of value in such a way uh, that the right people are attracted towards the brand. So let's take a look at the two groups that we might have listening. The residential group would be business to consumer and then the business to business group. What have been the most effective fishing pools or places where these potential prospects, shall we say, or leads could be contacted mm. for those two different groups? What have you been seeing and what would you recommend, Tom? Well, what the, look, there's 37 parts to this answer. Uh, so in other words, there's... Getting into those other groups is kind of like if you could imagine a combination safe and there's gold inside and you want to get inside there, it's really easy when you know the combination. But you imagine there's 30, 37 sequences, you know, 10 to the right, 7 to the left, and so on and so on. So there's a lot to it. But if I can just give you a real big picture, and the only reason I say that is the great danger that once I tell you what I'm about to tell you, that people might go, oh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, and it'll end in tears. <laughs> it would be like, it would be like this. It would be like, I go, to, I go to see Roger Federer play tennis for an hour and a half and I've never played tennis in my life. And then I turned to my wife and said, I've got it. I know how to play tennis now. I think I'll become a professional and it's not going to work. You know, I'm not even going to win a point. So, so uh, the question is, what was the question? Damn it. I've gone on for so long. I've forgotten it. <laughs> you're laying the groundwork for why you're going to tell us some of the most successful pools or, or areas where these people right. could be contacted. But you just gave us the caveat that if you don't have the foundational work done, that it's not going to work for you. Yeah, and if you don't have the approach right, yeah. Yep. Um, so you'll find there are most architects have worked with enough clients 
or they can find someone who has to figure out what we call a client avatar, a potential client avatar. There'll be a certain age range, or if it's commercial, there'll be a certain company size. Um, they'll be finding someone, maybe it's an office relocation, maybe they've heard of an office redevelopment. So um, there will be mechanisms within the marketplace whereby people are putting their hand up by reason of their avatar, which, as I said, could be gender, age range, et cetera, et cetera, so that people can be identified. Um, I don't know if that's specific enough for you, Enoch, but I'm not sure I can be a whole lot more specific other than the avatar. If you okay, well, let's just say you know, say I'm a contractor and I'm working with an architect. Where am I going to find these people? And and just give me an overview of the outreach. What's what's the kind of thing that I would be saying to connect with these people? I'm you know something like cold calling is one option. You could message them on LinkedIn. You could you know direct mail, like you said. What are the actual yeah. lead generation strategies that you're seeing that are most effective for these high ticket kind of? Well, well, well let's say solutions. let's say we recognized um, we recognized a town or a suburb in which people were, let's say, let's say we were looking at architects that were premium into the market, you know, multi-million dollar residential developments. So we, so we can get into the weeds and, and, and illustrate. So we'd be able to create an avatar. We know the, the types of areas these people live in. We would have a bit of an idea of their, their age range. Uh, we would know, for example, there's very often, if it's a husband and wife team, it's very often the wife that's going to be driving the idea. Uh, the husband's going to go along, you know, happy wife, happy life. Um, the husband will get involved with the details once the purchase decision has been made. But most of the time, if the wife really wants this thing, she'll drive it. So we've got a, we're forming a bit of an avatar already. And it's not difficult with Facebook and with LinkedIn, for example, to have a data miner who's doing all the detail work, remember, uh, finding, creating a list of people to contact. Um, the connection requests are made legitimately either through LinkedIn or Facebook, but let's not forget other people's networks. For example, let's say there's uh, a landscaping group on Facebook. The local community has a landscaping group or a garden tour group. You know. um, so, so contact is made from the contractor to the suspect at this stage because we don't know if they're interested. Um, the connection request is made using a template, which we figure out to make sure the message gets cut through and that it attracts the right people and not the wrong people. Um, once the connection request has been accepted, uh, then they're offered something, as I said, like a free guide or a survey or a profiling tool. The profiling tool can work incredibly well. So that's not a survey or a diagnostic. It's basically saying, let me ask you some questions about your ideal home and let's see which one of the seven categories you fit into. And on that basis, we can offer you some recommendations as to what you should be looking for in a home, whether it's a timber frame or God knows what, I don't know. <laughs> but the point is this, people love looking in the mirror. We all, you know, we do it all the time. We pass a shop window and we have a look and how am I looking today? Pretty much the same as you looked yesterday and the day before, but we all still do it. So profiling tools can be offered and that's the honeypot outside the forest I described before. When someone's interested in a profiling tool as to what sort of house or what sort of, you can do it at a commercial property as well, but what sort of architectural project is going to fit your personality style Someone takes that, they've automatically put their hand up, at least having an interest in the subject, and that's the honeypot, and then they can be invited to a more immersive experience. Does that help to kind of put some flesh on the bones? It does. It does. And, so, and, and all of that's happening while the architect is asleep on holiday or already working with other clients. Which is what they want to do. Design. Correct. Talk with people, talk with clients, and design. Okay. And so what what I'm picking up from you to make sure I'm understanding correctly here, Tom, is that you're recommending that the ideal avatar is identified. And ideal avatar is defined as the, the picture of the ideal client that a particular architect in our case would want to work with. Correct. And we go even further and we define what they don't look like. Awesome. The, the contractor gets... A $5 an hour wage, which in the countries that we tend to hire them from is pretty good. Some of them will get 10 bucks an hour, which is basically, you know, it's like a VP level almost. Um, they are highly skilled. I mean, we have MBA graduates working as contractors doing this, getting paid good money. And they receive a very significant monthly bonus running into the hundreds of dollars 
for getting the right people attending the meeting. So the bonus is not for registering for a meeting. The bonus is for when the prospective client shows up. So you have this team of highly motivated, metaphorically speaking, cats who just love the routine because they love, they know who to look for. It's very clear. They know what to say to them. It's copy and paste. And they're very motivated to follow up. And you get the right ones. They represent your brand incredibly well. My contractors all have leadsology on their, on their LinkedIn profile. I carefully select them and I monitor them carefully because I don't want them out there saying things that uh, wouldn't reflect well on my brand. But the good news for us is this is about a million of them that are waiting for work and they're highly motivated and they're not keen on tripping up because they know there's 999,999 behind them waiting for that job if they do. <laughs> and, I, and I treat them really well. You know, I just bought one a $2,000 computer. Actually, I made a mistake. I, I, I saw that she was working on a little tiny Inti laptop and I, this one does a lot of work for me. So I said, boy, that's a small laptop and you're doing a lot of work every day. And I thought that in the Philippines, a computer would be like, you know, 300 bucks because food's cheap there. No, <laughs> that was $2,000. So anyway, it was a little bit of an accidental generosity. But what I'm saying is that people, I, I want to say this because some people think that this, that we are, we're actually taking advantage of people and we're not. We're supporting people who in many cases couldn't find meaningful employment but are highly skilled and very motivated and we're paying them very well relative to the country that they're in. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that so people don't think that there's some sort of sweatshop happening. Okay, great. So what you've, what you've done here and so far in the interview, what I'm hearing, uh, Tom, is that you're speaking to me about a systematic process mm. for generating people who are interested in what an architect might have to offer or an architecture firm. That's correct. And you're talking about a repeatable process that can be put on autopilot and continue to bring in those consistent leads. Yeah. It, it, l let, me, let me shine the spotlight of reality on this. It takes the architect four hours a week to run the whole system. It still takes some time. They've got to meet with the contractors and check in on them at least once a week. Um, that's very important because the contractors have to feel they're a part of a team and you never have less than two contractors for, for, and you never outsource it to an agency. We, we, anyway, let, let me get back to the main point, shining a spotlight on reality check if you like. There's a lot of work to set this thing up. But once it's set up, it's relentless. And, and I say to clients, just imagine you've got a box with 100 angry snakes in it. You cannot lift the lid and take one out. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're going to get more coming out than, than, than probably you want. But to an extent, I, I personally, I feel an obligation to the contractors to say, look, we can fill this many meetings. This is all we want. And that's the work we can give you. It's five hours a week or it's 10 hours a week. I don't want to give it to them and take it away because even though they're not an employee, I want them to have a measure of reliability because they're going to start depending on the income after a while. H having said that, um, this thing is relentless because the contractors are relentless because we have hired people who are not waiting for a handout. They're not watching the clock. They want their monthly bonus. They're highly skilled, highly motivated, and they earn their bonus. And when they get paid 240, 300 bucks, that means a lot to their family. And so therefore, because we've selected them carefully, and that's another system in itself, they are freaking relentless. And that means you don't have to wake up on a Monday morning. I don't have to wake up on a Monday morning and think, oh, gosh, I've got to do some marketing this week. What am I going to do? Random acts of marketing. Should I go to a business networking meeting? Should I set up a trade show? Those days are over because you've got these contractors that are highly motivated, highly skilled, and they're just filling your pipeline full of prospects. It's a beautiful thing. Tom, I want to circle back to the beginning of our conversation. You were talking about um, some pre-faming, shall we speak, or the, the things that these people know when they get on the phone with you. We talked about their incoming. Mm. And then we, we, you mentioned they know your fee range, and they know the work you produce, and they regard you very highly. Correct. How do, we, how do we accomplish those last? We talked about incoming. We defined what that was. We talked about the four R's. When we mm. look at those last three things, the fee range, the work that, that, that I produce, 
and um, regarding me highly, how do we accomplish those things? What goes into that? Well, before they book a, a time to talk with you, most of those things will have been achieved. So during a presentation, you know, before I ended a presentation, I, my clients do this as well, they weave into the conversation what their fees are. My, you know, my fees range from $200 a month to $25,000 a month. And I talk about the different clients I serve and how I help each of them, but they know, they've heard it. Um, when they, they have to, remember, they have to go online and book a time to talk with the architect. That's the opportunity to direct interested people to what we call a landing page. And it's not a landing page to download a free guide or something like that. It's a landing page to book a time. So if people want an example of this, they can go to bookachatwithtom.com and they'll see how to do it. I mean, they can book a time to talk with me as well, of course, which is very clever of me, isn't it? But, <laughs> but, but, but there's two reasons for giving you that, of course. But one is to, so an architect can look at that page and see how before someone books a time with me, they've got to check three boxes to indicate that they understand what my fee range is, how I work with clients, and I can't even remember the third box, but, but they cannot book a time with me until those boxes are checked to saying, yes, I agree, I understand. Oh, the third one is, yeah, this is not going to be a free advisory session. This session is going to be see if what I have is a fit for your needs. So everyone is really clear. There's no, nothing hidden. It's not one of those icky things where you see someone's website and they go, book a free consultation with me and I'll give you all these ideas. And you know it's a sales trap. There's, there's none of that. Does that answer the question? In other words, there's a filter, there's a qualification process prior to someone being able to book it. They've got to physically click the boxes, then book a time with you. Hi there, I'm Tom Paul. Yep, that, that is clear, Tom. And cool. so in, if, one, if people want to get a hold of you, you talked about bookachatwithtom.com. Yep. And then you also shared a downloadable resource, how to stop relying on random acts of marketing. marketing. <laughs> right. Yes. So where can um, people go to get access to that material? The best place to go is going to be my, my main website, which is leadsology.guru. And I apologize in advance for the .guru, but .com was taken. <laughs> leadsology.guru. And there's a free stuff tab there. Everything from webinars to downloadable guides to excerpts from my, my latest book. Uh, there's a whole bunch of free stuff that people can just dive into. Um, and this is one of the things that we suggest that architects set up. There's a bunch of free stuff that's valuable on the website. Um, one of the beautiful things about architecture is that almost no one is stupid enough to think they can do it themselves. And that's a big advantage because even lawyers have prospective clients who think they should be able to represent themselves in court. Um, so that's a big advantage. So the reason I'm saying that is that you can't really give away too much free stuff in the architectural business. Um, because, because, as I said, anyone you want as a client is smart enough to know that they need your help, need the help of an architect at least. So, uh, and if we've got time, we've got two minutes, another tip for people. 3% mm -hmm. of the visitors to your website want to buy instantly. We track this a lot, a lot of different websites. 3% want to buy instantly. 12% uh, want to die and 12% We'll, have, we'll buy, we'll book a time to talk with you and we'll order, we'll you know, become a client after five exposures to your brand. Could be a downloadable guide, it could be a couple of videos, it could be a profiling tool, it could be whatever. But on the fifth time, then they act. That we call the explorers. They, they have a need to explore. 85% are just wandering around, they're shopping around. Uh, you want to be able to give every single one of those categories, the, the seekers who want to buy now, 3%, the explorers, 12%, and the wanderers, 85%, something that works for them. The wanderers want something short, simple, and shiny, a downloadable one-page guide of how to, my map, whatever. The explorers want to go in depth, and the seekers just want to find the link to book a time to talk with you. So you want to cater for all of those three segments, and that way you're going to be building your list. People sometimes say, well, why do you want to give the wanderers everything? They're just wandering around. But if, you know, if you're going for a walk through the, through the forest on a Sunday morning, just wanting to do a walk, and you see something shiny out of the side of your eye, and you, you go into the woods and it's a diamond, you pick it up, first thing that you do is you start looking for more diamonds. When people come to your website and they find something of value, even though they're only going for a wander, they find something of value, then they start looking for more things of value. I hope that makes sense. Tom, what question haven't I asked you that you think I should have asked you? 
Um, you, you should you should have asked me is how do I buy your product, Tom? No, I'm just kidding. Um, maybe uh, I know a question you should have asked. I don't know if I have long enough to answer it. What what are the common commonly recommended, traditionally recommended lead generation methods that people should avoid? That just don't either they should avoid them because they're too expensive, too complicated, take too long to work, or they just flat out don't work. You want me to answer that? Give me a couple, Tom. Okay. All right. So people talk about um, online funnels. Online funnels is is all array. Right. Just like you know, every eighteen year old has bought a course on how to sit on the beach with your laptop for half an hour every day and get all the money to wash over your beautiful body. But online funnels are first of all very very expensive to run. Back when I started doing them back in 2009, it was a dollar for an opt-in. Now it's 10 to $12 for get an opt-in. And when you can get opt-ins for free, I don't see good reason to use it. The other problem with online funnels is to do them well. See, some, some people think, well, I just put 20 bucks a day and see what happens. You're never going to get a result with that sort of money. You need a lot of money to put it in. And you've got to split test. You've got to have two different advertisements happening on Facebook or LinkedIn, wherever you're doing it. Uh, you've got to have two different landing pages. You've got to have two different offers on those landing pages. You've got to have two, two different autoresponder systems to back them up. And every single one of those four areas with both of those options, so there's eight different elements, you're split testing. You're killing off the loser, replacing it with a challenger to the champion at each of those four levels, if not every every week, then certainly every month. They're complicated. Um, they become expensive. Uh, and I'm in a joint venture mastermind group with some 50 to 60 other marketers. And I can tell you the ones that use online funnels are paranoid because they have one week where their opt-in rate goes up to $20 and their whole business model goes to hell in a handbasket. So that is something I'd avoid, which is probably going to be great news to most architects because the idea of managing that sort of detail at that sort of expense level is not, is not, uh, it's not one that uh, people view fondly or kindly. Other, others, so it sounds, like, it sounds like right there you're referring to paid online advertising that goes to uh, some it, sort of downloadable something yes exactly and and the so that's facebook ads in particular and linkedin ads um the 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 exception to this for some architects is google adwords which can work very well google adwords gives you the opportunity not to take people to your home page but page but people take people i'm sorry to a landing page where they can put their hand up for your downloadable guide and that can work quite well um, having said that they're often completely free options to have the same result. So you have to ask whether you'd want to do something when it's going to cost you 10 grand a month when you could do it for free. Any other to avoid strategies that you see that don't work that you want to bring up right now? Sure. Um, I, I have a personal pathological hatred of business networking meetings. Um, can they work? Yes, they can. Do they work? Seldom, but you know, even a blind squirrel finds an acorn in a forest once in a while. Trade shows I also dislike um, because both of these things position the architect as saying, essentially saying, pick me. I need clients. I'm looking for clients. The really interesting, one of the really interesting psychologies that we humans possess is that the moment people perceive that you are in need, they respond in a spectrum from apathy to aversion. So any marketing which positions the firm as in a state of need is to be avoided in my view. The most attractive psychology almost invariably is reverse psychology where the prospective client perceives that they need your services more than you need their money. Awesome. Tom, on a personal note, I'd like to finish with talking a little bit about your story, but what are you what are you excited about right now? Just in your own personal life or in your business, what is really just getting you excited about the future, whether it's personal growth or business growth? Tell me about that. Okay. Um, I'm excited about my next book coming out. I've, it's launching on my birthday, which is May 30. It's called Marketing the Invisible. Um, and I, I think it's my best work to date, but the market will judge that as it always does. Um, but I love writing, you know, I'm one of these weird geeks that doesn't really like going out of the house. You know, I sit on the beach here in Castaways Beach on the sand with my dog and 
I'm like a pig in mud. I come into my three big screens. It looks like a cockpit of a 747 in here. Um, and I'm just, so I just love writing. And so that's, that's a very much a labor of love. They are good client generators as well, books, but that's, I'm excited about that. Um, I launched a new program earlier this year, which is working incredibly well and clients are getting great results. So I'm excited about that. I mean, I'm genuinely excited. I'm just not just saying that so that people go, oh, he's just, you know, pumping his program. I really am. I'm excited about it. It's, it's probably like an architect finishing a project and seeing the house going up and walking through it. And, you know, you look forward to that moment when you can see the ideas that were in your mind coming, you know, coming to life in a building, I'm sure. So that's, that's kind of what it's like for me. The other thing I'm excited about is every Wednesday night I do a tennis competition. And I'm excited about that because I love tennis. And, uh, you know, I, I hit on the courts probably five days a week and I just love that ball coming over and the challenge that it's ever different every single time. Mm. Love it. Well, Tom Poland, thank you for being on the Business of Architecture with us here. It's been a fantastic conversation. And we've definitely drilled down into a lot of the weeds, as you said, but you've also given mm. us a lot of big picture ideas and strategies. Well, I have to say, I think you're the most thorough and in-depth interviewer I've ever had. And I've done quite a few of these things. Um, if, you know, if ever they make your job redundant, you should go to the CIA or the FBI and, and do some interrogation work for them because, by God, you get into the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and good for you because you've extracted maximum value for your audience. I think I have. And um, hopefully they can see a glimpse of what is possible for them. Tom, and obviously you've, you've done a lot of hard work setting up the program that you have and developing, finding out what works. And I'm a big believer in going with people that have a proven system. So mm. it's, all, it's all fun and games. But thank you. It's been a pleasure having you on here. It's been very enjoyable. Thanks, Enoch. All the best, okay. everyone. And that's a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to register for one of my upcoming free online trainings on how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk. This is a must if you're ever planning on opening your own firm or if you have a firm right now and you just like to have more freedom in that business. It's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. To discover how to market your firm to win better products and clients, sign up for one of my upcoming design firm free marketing trainings at architectwebinar.com. They are completely free and you can enjoy them from the comfort of your own home or office. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.